John, welcome to the show. It's great to be here, man. Thanks for inviting me. Here is where? H-Town, Houston? Yes, Houston, Texas, where I grew up. I've spent a little time there um, back. Uh, I know you're a fellow engineer. I was a biotech engineer once upon a time, and I remember going to a tissue engineering conference at Rice University right down the road where it was like 170 degrees or something in the summer. Um, <laughs> but everyone else there, it's all energy. Like you're, you come from an energy family, right? That's right. I do. My dad was the president of an oil exploration firm. Right. So what happened? You Texas. got too much, too much oil on your genes growing up. You, how come you're not a wildcatter? <laughs> well, the more interesting story is how he got into it. He grew up in West yeah. Texas around hay and horses, and he was allergic to hay and horses, which gets you to the big city uh, in Texas. Um, and uh, I tell people that I left Texas uh, during all the boom years. So I graduated from high school in 1973, um, which was uh, oil at, I don't know, 40 or fifty dollars a barrel maybe more and it kept going up after that um i returned and uh it went the uh, price of oil dropped by uh two-thirds after i got back home so i i uh, missed all the boom years from 1973 to 1985 when i moved back um and houston went from in my childhood houston the entire area was 450,000 people and that's now we're like seven and a half million. That's what air conditioning will do. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> so you uh, you had a couple stops on your way to, to the quant world, but um, I mean, Swarthmore, MIT, Harvard, what was the progression? Like, you know, had you had the intentions of uh, being an energy guy and then got headlocked or sidetracked by something else how 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 to no, what was the origin story i i um i read a book in high school called uh, the silent spring uh, which was an early environmental um book but an important one that made an impression on me and so i was out to uh, make a difference in the environment and in college um urban transportation seemed like a real world way to move the needle on that um so that was my first career uh, out of college. Um, and I have worked, uh, some, so my first, I don't know, 15 years or so was in transportation, urban transportation. Um, but I've worked in academia, in government, in nonprofit, and now for-profit work the last 28 years at Bridgeway. Well, uh, I want to hear all about it, but, uh, give me the, um, original inspiration. You know, the, if you look at the sort of arc of history on the uh investing quantitative side you're definitely um you know been been at this for uh a little while seen a few cycles what was the idea that originally called you to pop you popped into your head did you read uh some sort of influencing text early was it uh you know you were hanging out in omaha at the steakhouse or what <laughs> no i've never been to the steakhouse in omaha we've got good steak here in texas so i guess mm -hmm. it's never uh, you know pulled yeah. me up that way um but i'm uh i love service industries um and uh i was a shareholder in a cup two two iras um back in um the 80s I'm an engineer by background, so I love numbers and statistics, but, um, but anytime I receive poor service, whether it's on an airline or a restaurant or a hotel, at the other end of the stick on an investment and communications, I always think, well, you know, that's an invitation to, uh, um, for competition. Um, so uh, I thought there's gotta be a better way to communicate um, and to focus um, than the kinds of stuff I was getting as a shareholder. Um, that was when I was in business school. And I thought while I was at business school, I'll take a couple of investment courses just kind of on the side and maybe earn back the eventually the opportunity cost. Um, and my grades said that I should have gone to Wall Street, but I had absolutely no interest in going to Wall Street, nor intention to. I was in the transportation field. But I did have a knack for 
um, investments. And uh, I had a case study, this was at Harvard Business School of um, a quant uh, shop. And I thought, wow, you can, uh, you can use numbers and statistics to do all this stuff instead of the classic you know, CFA fundamental bottom up interview management, think about um, the economy and figure out what industries will do well and then figure out what companies will do well in that, you know, industry. It's like there's a different way to go about this. Um, and uh, so uh, I was in one class in particular and I had a behavioral finance insight. So this is before I knew anything about behavioral finance. Um, but the insight was at the end of this class uh, with the, the you know, quantitative methods, and I was completely turned on. Um, the professor steps back from the bulletin board, tugs on his beard and says, so how many people in here think like when you get out of business school, you can beat this track record? And 80% of the hands in the class go up. Now, um, that's not different from uh, any other place um, uh, uh, and I immediately recognized the 80 20 rules like 20% yeah, well, of people today, can actually um, outperform, um, and 80% of the people think they can. <laughs> that would be I was gonna uh, say today, uh, that's 99% on uh, that. Why is 80% so low now today on Robin Hood and everywhere else? I don't know, uh, you know, maybe optimism maybe, is closer to 99. And maybe the <laughs> maybe the database I was looking in had survivorship bias, ma'am. <laughs> that yeah, that yeah, could yeah. be the other uh, reason for that. Um, but I thought, you know, if this is true of, you know, Wall Street people five years from now, uh, then um, it should be, it should give a leg up for people that are using quantitative methods uh, in investing. Yeah. So I started doing that as a hobby for the Do next you recall, six uh, years. Well, there's two, there's two funny um, takeaways I have from this. The first is the, uh, you know, the, the lake will be gone analogy where we all can't be better than average. Yes. But the reality is you then built a incredibly successful quantitative shop. So uh, you were you were in the right cohort. Um, but second is, do you remember what uh, who was the case study focused on? Do you recall? By any you chance? know, I, I've got a name, but I, I don't know for sure. So I'm not going to give it. Yeah. I do know the professor's right. name. It was Professor oh, Parold. Right. That's awesome. The, uh, you know, as an aside, listeners will be stunned, uh, but there's some unbelievable number if you look at the Harvard uh, publishing yearly revenue is like $300 million or something. It's, it's some uh, incredible business, by is the way. Right? The, um, oh, no, sorry. The, and the business school in general, in general, uh, generates almost uh, a billion in revenue, but the publishing arm alone is a couple hundred million. So uh, great business, by the way. <laughs> um, all right, so you said, okay, there's numbers, uh, this is interesting. And at that point was it just hobby or like, what was the, what was yeah, the next so I, step? I started doing research on quantitative methods and kind of came up with uh, some thoughts about how I would go about it and started um, investing my own money that way uh, as a hobby. That was, yeah. that was uh, what I did for the next six years. At the end of six years, I had the thought, I think I might like to do this for my day job. Hmm. Um, uh, so it was a pivot point um, in my uh, career. I was 36, 37 at the time and uh, um, had some entrepreneurial bent, by the way, did not take a single course in entrepreneurism in, mm. in, uh, in business school, which is probably a good thing because I didn't know the statistics on the percentages of companies that don't make it to year five and year 10. They're not very good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, might've been discouraging to actually starting, um, but pitched You're in, uh, it did take us, uh, uh, three years to get to the break even point. Um, as an advisory firm, and my business plan had us breaking even in less than half that time. So, um, good good lessons in humility in the early uh, stages, and I'm a big believer in the power of humility in business. You know, um, one of my yeah, that's one of my favorite phrases. Is like the biggest compliment you can give anyone in the entrepreneurial startup world in asset management is just survival, right? Mm -hmm. Just the, just existing. So many entrepreneurs go into this. You talk to every entrepreneur at every startup uh, class or discussion, and everyone says, you know, most startups fail. 
but zero startup founders expect it to be them, right? <laughs> you know, and um, it's it's interesting to watch, like, you know, so many uh, companies and not even startups, you know, incumbents too. It's like, you look back at the old, uh, I think Buffett actually posted it in his annual uh, talk this year that it was like the largest market cap companies by decade, you know, and back when you were, starting out in the eighties, it was a lot of Japanese companies. And even in like the late nineties was a lot of the big tech in the U S and now it's totally different list. So it's hard just to stay relevant and uh, exist. But I was laughing as you were saying break even, because I was like, I don't, what does that even mean? We've been doing this 10 years. I'm still trying to find that (laughs) the, the, the promised land. All right. So what was the original, um, uh, sort of um, framework? Was it similar to what you're doing now? I mean, were you able to craft together some quantitative insights on a, I don't know, Commodore 64, Apple IIe? What was it back then? <laughs> yeah. Um, the only the only uh, computer programming uh, course I ever took was in Fortran 4, which definitely um, uh, dates one. Um, but they had uh, you know, spreadsheets were a deal and, and uh, there were some good statistical programs uh, even back then. Um, but um, one thing in terms of the founding of Bridgeway uh, was right about the same year as the seminal work on uh, value uh, by Eugene Fama. And um, I had, uh, the, you know, the size and the value factors uh, were just resonated with me. The whole concept of risk and return made sense uh, in my world. Uh, you know, smaller companies are more risky any way you want to measure it. Um, and seems to me like investors should be compensated for that. Um, one of the things that uh, some people will tell you about me is I'm, I'm kind of, I'm just cheap. Um, I like a good deal. Um, and uh, whether I'm buying a car or a refrigerator or a stock, um, that's my most favorite um, comfortable place to be. So I'm a contrarian uh, for the same reason. Uh, I'm most happy when other people are wringing their hands and I'm wringing my hands when most other people are uh, think that you know they own the world and things will go up forever. Um, so back to kind of behavioral finance aspects of that. Um, but uh, you know, continue to develop, you know, reading about momentum um, and studying uh, other factors uh, over the years. Um, but one of our first, um, one of our first three strategies was a, what I'll call teeny tiny, we call ultra small um, uh, size company. And it came from um, waking up in the middle of the night, thinking about what can a small startup firm do that the big guys can't do? And it's like, you know, I've seen those graphs of, you know, small size, like in uh, stocks, bonds, bills, and inflation. And there's more action on the really small end of the spectrum long-term. And I bet those stocks are not liquid enough for the big guys to play in. And that turned out to be true in spades. Um, So we've made a name for ourselves in very small stocks and they lean value and that makes me happy. Um, and at any rate, uh, a factors-based worldview uh, resonated with me. And that was all great and fine and dandy until, until I first read research on the low vol effect. The, um, you know, and I okay, went there's... like, it just like, wait a minute, well, wait, hold the horses here. Now you're saying that lower volatility, less risk. And by the way, this is like the metric that academicians measure risk by. It's not like yeah. we're picking a different one and translating some. I was like, take the exact same thing that we all measure risk by and lower risk companies do better in the long term. Like that, like how can that be? That, that rocked my world. Um, that's, where, uh, that's where behavioral finance uh, got to be a bigger piece of the pie uh, uh, for yeah. me and that there are non-risk reasons why stocks do what they do and people do what they do. Yeah. You, you know, some of your ideas and concepts definitely um, resonate. I jokingly, when you're talking about value, I, I love to refer to, you know, myself and the podcast listeners as cheap bastards. And I say that as a compliment um, as it applies to all works, all walks of life. Um, but, you know, the value approach certainly 
um, makes a lot of sense. And, and, and value in my mind is also being the, not just investing in the cheap stuff, but avoiding the really expensive, but um, you know, your fund, I, you, you guys may have to check the roles at some point, but I'm uh, my mom was definitely a shareholder at some point. You guys have closed this thing and reopened it over the years, the ultra small company uh, fund. So I don't know if mom Faber is still in there. I'd have to ask her, but she was a longtime happy shareholder for sure. Is that even still open to investors or is that closed currently? Uh, it is open. Uh, the ultra small company market fund uh, is okay. open. That's probably the one that she was in because we closed we closed the smaller um, version with fewer stocks back in, I don't know, 1997 or so. I don't know. It might have, she might have snuck in before. If the, she snuck uh, the in, then, then she's a long term. We don't lose many people in that in that yeah. strategy. And if she well, still is, you know, small stocks have done really well over the last year, admittedly off a slow, uh, a low base and, yeah. and a, and a, just a headwind, uh, painful one for small stocks decade yeah. <laughs> before that. And when you say the so last just, year has been good. So just for, um, kind of, um, anchoring when you say small stocks, like, what does that mean? You know, to, to the average person listening to this, like what's the market cap ballpark well, we, we talk small. about large caps, small, uh, mid caps, small caps, and micro caps and ultra small. So we're, we, we slice and dice it a bit more thinly uh, than most uh, people do. Um, and um, uh, to give you a rough idea, um, ultra small is breathtakingly small. These are companies, I don't have the most recent data, but on the order of 280 million at the top end. So our average market cap is significantly below that. Um, the Russell 2000 micro cap index only has 17% represented in ultra small stocks, the way we measure it. And we say ultra small stocks are stocks the size of the smallest 10% on the New York Stock Exchange. So it's not all stock exchange related companies. They trade on different exchanges, but, um, but you take all the companies on the nice and rank them by market cap and the bottom 10% in number is what we set. They represent currently about one third of 1% of all the dollars on the US exchanges. Wow. We're talking really small. They are very small. Yeah. And they're yeah. so cool. I just love them. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, there's like, the you, 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 read, you read about what they do, like you, you can read a financial statement and you can understand it. You think about the product, you can understand that. I mean, it's just more accessible than, yeah. you know. Um, but, but it's also, you know, it's always astonishing to me, you find these, uh, these businesses and um, versus the large competitors that have, I don't know, 30 Wall Street analysts following them and everyone uh, that's covered them to the decimal point on their annual statements. And it goes to this topic of just, you know, the Munger, old Munger quote of, you know, if you're a fisherman, like go where the fish are and there's no competition. It just seems to make a lot more common sense to not be uh, competing for who has the best Apple uh, cash flow model versus, you know, this tiny company in Louisiana or Oregon that, yeah. you know, sells yeah. steel widgets. I don't know. Um but it's fun. And the quantity approach, at least, you know, you don't have to cover 10,000 companies. You can you help use the computer. Um, okay. So the framework was, you know, value and small. You guys have since expanded into, you know, a number of different things. You got maybe what, like a dozen funds now? Is that about somewhere in the ballpark? Yes. We managed just shy of that. Yeah. Um, Walk me through how the, you know, philosophy and research process has changed over the years. You know, you've seen, uh, like I said, quite a few cool uh, and some painful uh, market events, you know, during this time. We got the 87 crash, the Japanese bubble, tequila crisis, you know, on and on. And even more recently, <laughs> you know, the last yes. few years have been pretty weird. Yeah. How things yep. evolved for you guys uh, as far as the research side. I want to get yeah. the actual company in a little bit. Well, um, you know, in some ways, uh, they haven't changed much at all. Um, so, you know, having a factors-based worldview, uh, I still think is a big advantage. Um, and 
so you know our our four uh, core um, pillars of our investment philosophy haven't changed, um, and um, you know some structure of uh, how we do uh, has and hasn't changed. Um, so uh, I didn't grow up in the industry. It's a little unusual that I started a company in a industry that I had never worked before. Um, people don't usually uh, do that. And it has all the disadvantages you would think of not having experience in certain areas and some other advantages where you, you don't have, you don't think things have to be a certain way. So especially on the culture side, um, Bridgeway is a very unusual place um, to work. But sticking to the research side, I guess the big thing that's changed is um, uh, access to quality data, longer term data, um, and these amazing people that I get to work with, um, the, you know, the systems and the automation, uh, we've got PhDs on the investment team now. Um, there are easily three or four people that can dance circles around me on statistics. Um, and so, and you know, like, I get to be in the room <laughs> with them. It's awesome. We really have a, a great team. So I didn't have any of those resources uh, in the beginning. Um, I remember one of our first paying for data was a company called Telescan and they eventually got taken over by somebody. I don't know who, yeah. um, but just to say the data quality has improved, um, yeah. you know, over the time. Uh, uh, Bridgeway has branched out into uh, some emerging markets, um, not on the mutual fund side at this point, um, but, uh, but that reminds me a little bit, bit more of the earlier years. Some of the data quality is not as good um, internationally uh, as we have uh, here in the U.S. You know, you mentioned Loval. Uh, feel free to talk about that for a little bit because it is a little odd. Uh, but in any other kind of factors or ideas over the past 20 years that have either been um, head scratchers or confusing or um, amazing that you're willing to discuss and not keep in the uh, kimono as far as, uh, you know, things you've looked at or studied that you think are particularly interesting? Um, well, it's, uh, you know, it's interesting to focus on where we where we do things uh, differently uh, and the same. So low vol is a, you know, fascinating to me because you just can't come up with a risk argument. Now I've heard people do so. Even Andy's got like, um, you know, some ways to look underneath, but it just seems like a stretch uh, to me. It's like we're talking about low standard deviation. The price doesn't move so much versus the ones that do a lot. Um, I was at a conference where they said, this is not really the low fault vol effect. It's the not high vol effect, mm, which is to say the real value add is on the short side, staying away from the very volatile um, companies. Um, and that has been um, our experience, except um, some of the, uh, the quantitative models that we've got feed off of that volatility to separate out good companies from bad companies according to some other metric. Um, a related quote that I'll mention is from Elena on our team who once said um, she had done some research on fixed income for some reason. And she came back and reported on our, in our weekly meeting, she said, I just like stocks so much better. They move. <laughs> <laughs> and with respect to high volatility, um, in some ways, it's easier to see what's going on when there's um, more movement there. But as a generalization, we all know now low vol um, is better. So um, that's what I'd say about that. One of our pillars of our investment philosophy is focus. So we believe in strong factor expo exposures. Um, and we have strategies in two camps, one called Omni and one called Select. Um, and think of Omni as we're trying to give exposure to what we think of as an entire asset class or a, a, a large niche. And it tends to mean you've got more companies. So we might have an like our Omni small value strategy has hundreds of stocks in it. Um, and it gives you, you know, very wide exposure to something in particular uh, you're looking at or your mom's ultra small company market um, strategy. Similar, we've got hundreds of stocks, like 500 teeny tiny stocks um, in that. 
our select strategies tend to have fewer number because we're focused on what we call the tip of the spear. So if you think of you're buying value companies and to simplify it, let's say, you know, you're ranking stocks by price to earnings. Um, and what I can tell you is that, you know, the cheapest, if you, well, say you're ranking the Russell 2000, 2000 stocks by that, the, the, two, the 200 cheapest stocks, which would comprise what we call a decile, 200 out of 2000, so 10%, um, don't give you as strong factor exposure as um, the uh, cheapest um, 500, well, uh, um, from 200 to 50 stocks and from 50 to 10. Now, at some point you've got instability um, so you don't want to just invest in 10 stocks and all the rules of diversification apply. But with respect to strong factor exposure, fewer is better. And so our select strategies tend to blend different factor exposures, but with very serious exposure to the individual factors um, that you can. So uh, there's cool research um, around that to know how, you know, how low do you go? Everybody, everybody who's like factors based believes this is true to some degree because typically they're not buying, you know, the top half and not the bottom half. It's more focused than that. And so the question is, where do you stop? Um, and part of the answer to that is liquidity. Again, the big companies are going to have more companies because they need to push through a lot more dollars in order to make money. But that's one of our advantages. We don't have to do that. So I like the, I like the less liquid markets. Um, you know, um, ultra small emerging, um, as Elena says, they're, they're kind of more fun, um, yeah, because they well, move and it, and it, and it, uh, it, it, it plays to our strength experience. First of all, we've got 28 years experience doing this now. Um, trading is the other huge piece of that, um, transaction costs get to be a much bigger piece of the pie when you're talking about less liquid companies, obviously. And Bridgeway has a lot of experience um, I was, with that. The uh, I was say, I was thinking as um, she was talking about the bonds don't move that much. I say, well, just ask the long term capital guys. You put enough <laughs> leverage on these suckers, and they can move too. You know, yes. So all you need is five hundred to one leverage, John, and then it will uh, be volatile. You know, um, that is so true. Uh, before I started um, Bridgeway. Uh, I, I did something that I saw uh, another businessman in, in, in Houston do. He was the mayor and he had had five different careers over his lifetime. And each time he started a new venture, he took a year off to study the heck out of the next thing. So I actually did that when I, when I went from transportation to um, investments. And as part of that, um, I was studying my own, my own methods, which had been even more successful than I had thought that they would be. So I was trying to understand why that was and drill down and studying historical data. Well, part of the data that I studied was downside data, right? Like if you're a value player or you're a contrarian and for anybody that's gonna use leverage, you wanna know how it looks when it looks really, really bad. So I went back and studied the Great Depression, like 29 through the 30s. Like if you want to steep yourself, like, you know, 2020 pandemic was a yawn compared to what they experienced yeah. in the Great Depression. Now, it was much faster. The more recent downturns are pretty steep and much faster. But this was, you know, decade, decade long. It took to 1938 to get back to the high point of um, uh, 1929. But one of the things I learned about that is the Dow Jones Industrial Average, for, which they got pretty good data on back then, and you know, crisp data goes back that far as well, um, dropped 86% from the, from the peak to the base, 86%. And to me, I'm, I'm a big believer in stocks for the long term, like just you know, buy them and then hold them forever is a great time frame. I, you know. I mean, it is cash, it's money. If you don't spend it someday, you got to ask, what is it for? Well, maybe it's for the, I don't know, next generation. Um, or we've got interesting uh, things there, but an 80% drop will pretty much wash out anybody that's using leverage. You'll get a margin call a long way before that. So I made a decision before starting Bridgeway, never use leverage to, you know, in a straightforward way. 
uh, we use uh, some derivatives in one strategy to dampen uh, the market risk of the fund. Um, but we, we, we never ever leverage um, using uh, borrowed money. So that's one of the things that I learned in the beginning yeah, I mean, has not changed. You know, I mean, it's, it, it's obviously um, essential to be a student of history when it comes to markets, you know, going through what we've been through in the past 20 years, you know, we've had two, about 50 percenters in the US and last year, really fast uh, and back up a um, little jiggle. But compared again to an 80% plus, it's hard for people to fathom just how bad that is. And you've had that in some other countries since then, yes. uh, outside the US, but not as much in the US. And that creates such a mass. I mean, if you think the behavioral issues the last 20 years are, are problematic when your stocks go down 20% or, you know, even 50, <laughs> um, 80 is a whole nother ballgame. Because I think it's like a Richter scale for earthquakes. It's like every 10% gets 10x worse. So down 10, people start complaining. Down 20, you're getting like clients, you know, closing accounts or angry at you. And this applies to underperformance too. Uh, you know, and then and then everything after that is just people stop opening accounts, you know, yada yada. Um, there's a good book uh on this time called I think uh, The Great Depression, a diary that uh walks through, I think as a lawyer, but he was talking from an invest in, investing angle listeners that uh I think is is a really thoughtful way to go about it because so many people i think assume they'll be able to buy hand over fist rationally when things are down 50 60 70 80 but the problem and this was a conversation i had in, in some countries over the past five six seven years nobody has any money <laughs> you know it's like if you are the rare exception that has some money to put work when something's down 80 great but usually it cleans house for m almost everyone yeah yeah, it happens uh, typically at the worst possible time, or at least when you're worried about that. So take, you know, 2008 or 2020, you know, one of the things on your mind is, oh, shoot, I could lose my job. Um, and a lot of people did uh, in, in both cases. Um, you know, 15% unemployment is steep, but um, it's not everybody. I tell people the, you know, again, being a believer in uh, stocks for the long term, you, you, you shouldn't have money in the stock market that you might need in a few year period. That's an in, improper use of a financial um, instrument. So match your investment horizon to an appropriate um, security and stocks are um, for the long term. Also have an emergency fund. So know what you're going to do uh, I like to say, you know, you need you need enough money in the bank that if the engine of your car falls out on the road, you 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 have the money to replace it. And you don't have to sell stocks at what might be the worst time um, to do it. And then you need an ultimate uh, plan. You know what my ultimate plan is? Hmm. Go to well, space with Elon or Jeff, no, I should say. Bezos, no, it's, Jeff, it's move Bezos. in with mom. Come on, it's yeah. move in with mom. I had, yeah. there are all these 30 somethings and like, I never move in with my parents. I will never do that. You know, it's like, I'm an adult. And it's like, yeah. guys, just get, a, you know, like get a life, get over it. Yeah. You know, you move in with them, they move in with you, you know, you, you can handle it. Life yeah. gets more difficult than, you know, having to deal with that. Well, my mom is 98 now and wow. she's amazing. She's the force in my and other people's lives. And I'd been giving speeches saying like, you should have a backup plan. And, and you know, it's like if things, you know, just the, like stocks don't exist anymore and, and I'm nobody will hire me anymore. It's like, I'm, you know, I'm, I'd have to sell my house and, but I'm, I've got a place to move. And then I thought, you know, I've, I've never actually asked my mom that. So I called <laughs> her up on the phone and said, mom, people think uh -huh. that you're moving in with me. It's like, she's like, well, that's never going to happen. Um, yeah. But I've never asked you. And she said, yeah, sure. You can come over here. We'll have a good time together. So I that's my old bedroom. Plan. I even got your old high school photo a, still up. That's you know, a... so have an, have an emergency fund um, and have a backup plan for if, if the, you know, if the 1930s hits again. Uh, and then, you know, hopefully it's not going to hit again. We know more about the we know more about the economy than we did back in the 1930s. On the other hand, we didn't have nuclear, you know, 
war risk in the 1930s like we do today. So risk, that's another thing I've learned is like there are different kinds of risk, but thinking about risk um, is key and important and, you know, um, do identify it, do manage it, and then like, but don't run from it because you'll be running from some of the wrong things. Some of our biggest opportunities in life, frankly, have risk attached to them. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, um, I was, as you were talking about that, my mom, every time she comes to visit me in Los Angeles, because I don't own a house and we tend to be transient, uh, she like brings a suitcase of my stuff. She's like, I'm tired of storing this. She's like, you're, I'm just gonna, this is a one-way street. You can do with yep. it whatever yep. you want, but yep. she, you know, she's like, I've been saving, saving this pottery or this whatever of mine. And she's like, yeah, I, it's long enough. Um, I love you, mom. Uh, yep. <laughs> so, you know, so yeah, I mean, it's, you know, having this long-term perspective, you know, I, is so essential. It doesn't make any easier. You know, you've probably dealt with, um, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of clients over the past 20 plus years. Um, do you have any general perspective or comments on just kind of how to think about these different markets and regimes? You know, I think a lot of people looking at uh, where we are now with um, whether you talk about sentiment or valuations or SPACs or, you know, everything rents repeat over, over every cycle, but, you know, thinking about some of the best practices uh, on how to think about sitting through the lean times. And that can mean either drawdown in an asset class, but also drawdowns in strategies, right? Um, of any strategy, it could be commodities, it could be value, it could be, you know, US bonds, stocks, whatever. Um, well, my thought overall on asset allocation, I, I know you have a more sophisticated uh, view on this uh, than I do, Matt, but I, my overall uh, thing is uh, have an appropriate asset allocation, write it down, implement it, stick with it through thick and thin, and especially when it feels less least comfortable to do so. So I've got a, you know, a static target of how much of each of our Bridgeway strategies I invest in. And so what does that mean? What am I all, what am I investing new money in? It's always in whatever's gone down the most. Mm -hmm. That's a, yeah. you know, and, and so, you know, having, having that and the discipline of that, I think is, um, is great. And one thing that I would uh, highlight, you know, are there things out of favor? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, small size was out of favor. And I just love the articles that come out, you know, when, when something is out of favor, it's like, oh, the small cap effect, the small firm effect uh, is dead or probably was never there. And there's some actually quite good academic papers on this from which you conclude, can conclude from a factors-based worldview um, that other factors um, can explain away um, the size effect. Um, so uh, you put the right combination together and size becomes statistically insignificant. Um, and there's nothing flawed in the research. The research is solid. It's just that when you step back, you go, so however, these factors work better, the smaller size you go. So it sounds to me like semantics. <laughs> you can say factors work better in smaller, less liquid um, companies, or you can say there's a small firm effect. And to me, it doesn't change your action in having a percentage exposure uh, to um, that as an asset class. There's one other thing before we get away from it that I wanted to mention in terms of you know advice for people, and that wouldn't be on the specific um, uh, you know market niche side, it would be on the more general. And that is the single biggest thing you can do um, over a lifetime uh, that makes a difference is um, adjusting your spending relative to your revenues, uh, which means save and invest. You know, have a, it doesn't matter how good or, well, if you're a really poor investor, that's pretty bad. You can do damage if you're, at any rate, you have to have a nest egg um, to do so. And the power of con compounding is huge. So I'm, I like, I love to preach to teenagers. So like get a job, save. And if you start early, 
it will be so, so much easier. People make the mistake of thinking like, oh, when I get a, you know, if I wait another decade, I'll be making more and it'll be easier to save. No, 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 that's wrong. You know, save 10%, save 20%. I've got a friend who, who got married, you know, in his 20s and he and his, he, he and his wife agreed that they would save one of their salaries. Brilliant, brilliant. And like, it worked. Promise, I promise you, like, it worked. Um, and you don't have, these days, you don't have to be rich to take part in that. You know, you can get a low cost, you know, index fund and open an account for zero commission and like four basis points of cost. I mean, how great is that for the small investor? That's awesome. But you got to save and invest. And if you run the numbers, saving 10%, 20% is not that hard. People tell me, it's like, well, you don't understand, John. I got a mortgage and, you know, got kids and I'm this and that. It's like, it's not that hard. All you have to do is find somebody that makes 20% less than you do. Their income's 20% less and study the heck out of their lifestyle. That's the lifestyle you need. So that's my, I'll get off my soapbox now, but I, I love to have younger um, younger folks in the room. And it works reasonably, you know, later in life too, but the power of right. I mean, look, is a you, big deal. You, You've nailed it. I mean, we, we, you and I could probably spend, uh, you know, hours and hours just discussing the intricacies of factor models and like the most uh, in-depth academic papers. And in reality, all of this is trumped by when you decide to start investing, how much you save, and that's it. Like it, it the best day is yesterday, but the second best day is today, right? And it's yeah. such simple advice that it's so important. It's more important than everything else combined, in my opinion. And so- um, I'm with you, we, I agree. I'm only gonna add one caveat to what you said, which is after you have that plan and write it down, you got to share it with someone so they keep you honest. It's like a diet, right? If you're like, oh, Dude, yeah. I'm not going to eat, I'm cutting yeah. out pizza, but you don't tell Fair anyone, Fair you enough. know, if you tell your significant other and they see you sneaking a slice of DiGiorno, then they can, you know, slap your hand or something. So, um, <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's mine. I say, you got to share it with someone, uh, or even better is, uh, you know, put it on some sort of automation too. all the behavioral nudges that just whirs in the background, you know, I think it's such a, wonderful uh approach that that 20 percent you're talking about it's a lot easier when you don't even see it you know it gets skimmed off the top and tossed in a savings account and that's that um yep altogether good advice too too sensible um i'd like to talk a little bit about you know you guys uh going going back to the earlier part of the conversation have survived uh not only survived but thrived um built a great organization that's lasted through the various markets. And uh, there's a statistic that over 10 years, roughly half of all public funds close. And um, so to at least uh, continue to, to be around is a huge compliment, but you've also built this organization in your image, which is different than most. And would love to hear a little bit about you know, kind of that philosophy and, and progression over the years, because it actually, I think it has a big impact on uh, the funds and, and probably the clients you end up with too. Well, first, I hope it's not in my image. Uh, you know, I, I, it's not Montgomery Asset Management. <laughs> yeah. I love, um, I love one of, the, one of the people that I work with, we call everyone with a long-term commitment here, partners. Um, and one of my partners like gave me a lesson on John. Our job is to be here and set a foundation. The next generation is gonna stand on our shoulders and do much bigger things. I think that's a wonderful um, image um, for the future, but the staying power, uh, our president Tamara Philippe likes to talk about um, Bridgeway as an enduring firm. And we actually have a plan to be around in 50 and 100 years. So I was in a room full of entrepreneurs one time and they said, who, you know, who here expects your company to still be in business in any recognizable form in 20 years? 
out of 17 people, I was the only hand that went up in the room, the only mm -hmm. one. People asking like, what's your exit strategy? Like, are you going public? Are you gonna be bought out by private equity? Some big competitor are gonna swallow you up. And if you don't make plans, uh, that's the natural tendency. So we did two things at Bridgeway um, for that. Uh, one is um, we set up a structure um, uh, inside of which uh, the ownership of the firm uh, moves into what's called a special purpose trust that can hold those shares in perpetuity. Um, and, uh, and that creates a lot of stability uh, in ownership. You don't have to worry like what happens if John dies? I was like, frankly, not that much as far as, you know, like the team behind me is deep and broad and, and the ownership structure uh, the, the, the second thing that gets people is um, inheritance taxes. So either, um, you know, founders want to cash out to go retire and I've saved up my money just like anybody else at Bridgeway in a 401k and, and you know, maxed out my IRAs every year and, and saved aggressively and, and invested, uh, you know, uh, stocks for the long term with our own strategies. Uh, so done all that. So that's my retirement money. My retirement money's outside. I don't need to tap the firm uh, to do that. And I've got a, we've got a structure now where Uncle Sam, um, uh, uh, it's, it, it perpetuates from generation to generation. Um, we've got a, um, uh, what we call a partner stock ownership plan that helps feed that. Um, there are a number of ways uh, where we, uh, where we don't have to sell the firm to raise money for taxes uh, in an estate situation um, and where I don't, I like I told my children, I told our fellow partners, I'll never um, use my ownership in the firm for personal, you know, for spending personal things. Now, giving is a different story, which maybe we'll come to, um, but, the, but the pattern from the beginning uh, was that we're a long-term, really long-term, multi-generational player. So it's not about me. It's about, I mean, think about if you knew you were going to be around, Meb, in 50 years, not you personally, but your firm, what would you be doing differently today so that those people have the advantage of how you've invested in them today? I don't, I know very few people who think about that. And it's so powerful. I mean, just the, like, if you think... <laughs> You know, we're still a relatively, you know, we have 5 billion under management. That sounds like a pretty big number to me, but, um, but it's, we're still a very small fish, you know, in the big pie. Um, but, you know, a generation and two from now, I think we're going to be a bigger force uh, to, uh, to deal with. Um, and it's not just about the money. It's not just about what we do. It's also the power of being a generous giving um, company. So I like being an enduring firm. I like the generosity aspect of what we do. I like um, that uh, we, we, we made a commitment when we founded Bridgeway 28 years ago that we give half of our profits away and we, and we save and invest the other half for what we call our rainy day fund. So in a downturn, rather than laying everybody off or closing up shop, like sadly some of our closest competitors had to do last year, um, that's when we selectively hire because that's when great people are available. And then when you come out the other side, like you got to be strong, you got to, you know, you got to continue to grow and expand. So that's the formula that we've been um, working on for, you know, a generation now, 28 years um, yeah, and yeah. got more to go. I would say I, I wouldn't uh, sell yourself short. You got the genes to last the triple digits in modern medicine. You may be like Ted Williams style, head head in a uh, you know a, a tube somewhere, living to three four hundred years from now. So we may uh, we, we may be doing this by hologram in uh, twenty two twenty. Um, <laughs> you mentioned this concept of uh, giving, and I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about it because it's a um, I wouldn't say it's um, it's certainly not universal. It's not even necessarily traditional. Uh, talk to us a little bit about y'all's philosophy and how you go about it. Well, um, there are a number of giving philosophies now and, and companies that are doing some great things uh, here. So Bridgeway is certainly not the only one. At the time that I started Bridgeway 28 years ago, I didn't have a single model of doing this. I just had a thought that, A, you know, like, your revenues don't have to drive your expenses. And we had a certain standard of living 
my wife and I were already there. Um, we didn't need more stuff. And I actually was worried about that with respect to raising small kids, which we had three of at the time. Um, and we thought, well, if Bridgeway is successful as you know, I've been personally investing over the prior six years with the low cost strategy, it should be a cash cow. I mean, it's, it's, and what would you do with that money? And so that's where was born the idea, well, let's give half of it away. And it'll be a lot more fun to do that along the way than like, at back then, mostly people just did at the end of life. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with that either. Um, but I just thought it'd be more fun. And then I had the thought, and this was like when I founded Bridgeway, I thought I had a dozen good ideas. Now, I would say maybe three of them were marketable. <laughs> not hmm. nine of them. It's like I still think one or two other ones were a good idea, but not marketable. I've got way more unmarketable ideas. You should see my. <laughs> what, you should see our prospectuses of those un, are, uh, those are unlaunched fun funds. It's like a not. It's a pre graveyard of of, the, of ideas that no one will ever like. Uh, well, the going. the one the one idea that was ten times more powerful than I had any idea of was this generous giving giving half back. Um, and we folded it into the culture of the firm. We use it to attract like-minded people. Um, you know, if you're in if you're in investments, you can make a lot of money. That can attract you know greedy people. So we have um, a stewardship uh, pay plan where we we try and get off of the more is better forever, um, and you know talk more about quality of life and what we're here for, purpose. Um, but the generosity side. Um, it's it's easier to attract people. It's amazing what you can do in the world. As in our case, a pretty small firm. Um, so we have a, a an affiliated uh, Bridgeway Foundation. Um, if you want to get uh, if you want to get a view into uh, that part, um, which um, has to do um, with advancing peace, reconciliation, and ending genocide, um, we have other things that we uh, support. Uh, each other in terms of partners' interest at the firm, but that's mine and a significant one of the foundation. If you want to get a view into that, um, Shannon Davis, who's the head of our foundation, wrote a book, um, came out a year and a half or so ago, and um, and it's called To Stop a Warlord. So it has to do with peacemaking efforts in um, Sub-Sahara Africa, which is our focus area. Uh, and I have to say, I, I thought it would take a lot longer to get to the point that we are in making a significant difference for peace uh, somewhere in the world. And the people that we work with are some of my biggest heroes. It's just unbelievable. Um, I mean, and, that, that's a pretty, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure the listeners are like, you know, if you were to ask uh, uh, most people, they're like, what's your number one? They're like, world peace. But like stopping genocides is a pretty ambitious uh, goal up there too. Um, like with that, give us like the kind of back flap of the book, like how I'll definitely pick up a copy, but, um, it's, um, you know, how does one I, even go about thinking I, about that? I didn't, I didn't think it was going to be possible to ever write a book because we work with people on the ground whose identity would put them at risk, right? Like they're true heroes. And I'm, I'll just mention there was a, in the last couple of months, um, a, a, a true hero that we worked with and knew um, who was a Muslim um, preaching like peace and good things. And he got assassinated. He got taken out. Um, so sad. And like he was willing to stand up to say the right thing and it put a target on his back and somebody took him out. So like it can happen, but it just reminds you of the, the seriousness of that. Um, so I thought we were never going to be able to write a book. Shannon figured out a way to do it. And it's, um, it's Shannon in her role in the foundation. It's Shannon as a mother. Um, and it's David Ochiti, who was a child soldier um, in the conflict that we were working on at the time. And it's the subject of this book. Um, and he escaped uh, after six months um, in the bush as a child soldier. And like, there's nothing more horrific than what happens to kids as soldiers. Yeah. Um, but now, um, he helps other people who have escaped, like re-enter re -enter society again, which is a really big deal. Um, so it's that story, um, and it focuses on the people we work with um, and some of the heroes uh, that are uh, there in the area. 
um, that we're working on. I'll tell you one very brief story. Sometimes people are like, yeah, you know, there's the bumper sticker that says world yeah. peace, you know, it's like, yeah. oh yeah, right, peace, you know, you know, <laughs> great dude, you know, kind of like, yeah. how do you actually accomplish anything? So uh, in this book and in this period with the LRA, they did a bunch of work um, uh, uh, with, you know, governments, um, other civil society people, just some just individual heroes, people making the right choices for the right reasons. And you think, gosh, we need more people like that in the world. Um, one of the things that they did was uh, uh, trying to get these child soldiers, and then some of them are like, you know, 25 years old. They get, you know, if they're out there long enough to defect uh, and to reintegrate back in their home. Well, they all, they've all been told they can never come back home. So um, it, it meant uh, taking an airplane, flying over places where these soldiers are, dropping leaflets saying, you know, if you meet us at these safe zones, uh, we'll get you out. And there's an amnesty program back in your home country. So like, well, that's cool. And people have been using planes to drop leaflets forever, right? Like, I mean, as, as long as there have been planes, they've been used in wartime and good and unfortunately mostly you know, for destructive reasons. But we were doing it trying to get people out to reduce the number of combatants um, and bring peace. So, so one of our partners we're working with came up with the idea, it was like, well, we, we actually got a few out. The very first ones that come out, you go like, that's awesome, it works. Uh, and then who within that, you know, who among your fellow soldiers is susceptible to being called out? And you get names and you get villages where like they grew up. You go to the villages and you interview, say, their mom and their mom's voice. You record it on tape, mm. calling them back home, saying there's a place for them back home. Then you go out in a plane and you play this recording over a loudspeaker. Hey, Joe Smith. Well, obviously not Joe Smith, but, you know, the person's actual name with the voice of the mother. It turns out that the voice of the mother is incredibly powerful to call soldiers back home. And I think that's brilliant. It was effective and we didn't fire a single bullet to do it. Man, that's powerful. That's tough to hear. Mom's voice that uh, definitely uh, bring, bring peace to the world, bring anybody home. Absolutely. Um, John, this has been a whirlwind. Uh, let's do a few uh, quick questions to kind of start to wind down. Um, First, uh, what do you think that you believe that the vast majority of your contemporary financial professionals don't? So meaning like it's somewhat of a contrarian view, but it's something that you believe like pretty strongly at your, at your core. Anything come to mind? There's probably a lot. Well, um you know, from March of last year uh, as the peak point um, that the small firm effect, you know, is dead. Uh, we like to look at very long periods of time. Um, and so I don't, I don't think that we've got ways of measuring how far out of favor something is. It's always good to keep in mind, no matter how cheap something is, it can always get cheaper. There's always more, one more standard deviation of how far out of favor it can get. So, um, lessons in that one humility and two staying in for the long haul. Like we got, you know, we got the equivalent of a decade of returns all in one year yeah. in the last year, but you gotta, you gotta average that. That's not going to be repeated next year. You gotta average that over, you know, the whole period of time and, you know, suffering through that, that part. So I would say, you know, that the small cap, uh, firm, the small firm effect is dead. Um, with the caveat of you know what I mentioned previously, so that was getting to be um, a minority view. Uh, another one is that stocks are risky and bonds and money markets are safe. And to me, uh, the answer to that is a couple. It's a little complicated, but it 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 the answer is it depends. So if you need money two years from now stocks are risky and money markets are safe. That's would be a true. However, if you've got a 10 year time frame, it's much messier because we all spend after inflation dollars. 
Yeah. And if you inflation adjust, if you go back over the last hundred years and look at T-bills, which are supposed to be the risk-free rate, that's in finance, they call it the risk-free rate, which I always small at, smile at because like they're not even AAA rated anymore, you know, it's like by one agency at least. Um, but apart from that, let's say the U.S. is always going to be here and they really are safe. Inflation can decimate the purchase power of T-bills. Note the 1940s in the U.S. The purchase power of a dollar invested in T-bills with interest reinvested through the entire decade of the 1940s, so 1940 to 1950, declined 41%. Now, if the stock market goes down 41%, you think, oh my gosh, a bear market, this is huge, this is, a, oh, this is so awful and it's so painful and what happened, to, you know, where did my money go? Like with T-bills, which are the risk-free rate, you still got to adjust it for inflation. And on that basis, stocks are safer than T-bills because what happens in inflation? If inflation kicks in, businesses raise their prices and you know recalibrate but fixed income is by definition fixed you're just stuck with less and i know people in houston that like did ladder cds as a way to retire because they were in banking and in 79 80 they got decimated by inflation well it's been a long time but we haven't seen probably in my lifetime and for sure in yours uh meb the last um the last bout of inflation in the u.s and people are just completely asleep on that yeah some people are talking about it but nobody's doing squat about it you know you mentioned a couple of things i mean uh we do a lot of twitter polls and we did a twitter poll basically touching on what you talked about which was says like you know um when you invest in safe t-bills like what well, what do you think your biggest loss was after inflation and you know everyone said zero to ten or zero to five uh, and almost no one said the reality, which was you got, you know, cut in half at one point. Um, it tends to be more of a slow bleed unless it's like a 70s, exactly. you know, exactly. gusher. But uh, this concept of, of time horizon certainly I think is really important um, on the volatility and, and holding periods and all that, all that good stuff. Um, what do you think has been your most memorable investment? Anything come to mind? Uh, well, thousands of probably tens of thousands of stocks you guys have owned over the years. Uh, any any stick out uh, as being particularly memorable? Good, bad, um, in between. Doesn't yeah, have to be so, stock. Sorry, just investment. Sorry. You know the disposition effect says the painful ones uh, stick in your memory more, but you know I'm contrarian, so the reverse is true. Um, so <laughs> we owned a value stock like we bought it because it was a value stock and this was like mm -hmm. you know a year year and a half ago i don't remember the exact date but it was cheap that's why we bought it um and in january of this year it went zonkers um and we have a whole process a very disciplined process about what we do when something gets to be too big a piece of the pie uh and i have to say the you know the top two time three time four times i can remember a stock that's gone zonkers our risk management around the discipline of that has paid off every single time. It's shocking the percentage of time that it's paid off. It shouldn't even be that much. Um, Christine on our team went back. She she had the idea. It's like, you know, I wonder where this compares to other individual stocks in an individual month. So she went back through the CRISP database, which we're coming up on 100 years of. <laughs> and do you know this stock ranked number three of single month returns through the entire history well what what was the other two i wonder I, that's a great uh i you know this, i i, I can the can't same tell you stock that. the next I month i can't <laughs> tell you but they none of them were real recent you know some yeah. of them went back uh, quite a number of years um and uh and, and there, there was one other stock. I'm going to tell the story on the earlier one, and then I'll just give you the name on the second one. Um, the, the other time in my career, I remember one that went zonkers just like that, um, was an ultra small stock. It was a Maine, a state of Maine, um, fish oil company. Like 
they went out, you know, like they actually fish, mm -hmm. they get fish, they make it in fish oil, sell the fish oil. That's what the company did. This was in 1998, 99. Well, in 1999, when the internet's going, this company has all this cash around, right, on their balance sheet. They don't know what to do with it. Could return it to shareholders. But they announced that they were going to be buying up internet companies. That's what they did. They, they didn't actually buy any. They just said they were going to buy some. The stock price started from like seven and peaked out at about 23. And we sold most of ours in the top, in the high teens. And I did it, this is back when I was trading myself. I did it the day after Thanksgiving in 1999, in the middle of this. And I'll never forget, it's like, I'm selling to somebody and maybe it'll go to 50 before it stops. But we bought a value company. It's no longer a value company. The reason we bought it's no longer true. Um, and there's all this, you know, hoopla around it. That's a time to manage your risk, to diversify. And um, that's what we did. So that's yeah. the story. Uh, the name, uh, the more recent name uh, was GameStop. There's so many interesting lessons on this. The biggest one, which goes back to what we were talking about earlier, is Everyone, you know, we are, and, and I think it's important, has a process to talk about what happens when things go wrong. But you also have to have a process to think about when things go right, you know, the right yes. tail on how do you approach it or how do you position size? How do you think about selling without losing your, uh, your mind, you know, and, and do you have a disciplined set of criteria? Now, the joke's going to be on both, both of us when it goes to uh, a thousand next month, and we <laughs> we were the the pikers that uh, that don't own it anymore. But um, yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's fascinating. That's true, to but, hear. It, but it but it won't be small, and it won't be value, so it doesn't yeah. have a place in our small that's value right. fund, which is where we yeah. had it back then. I like just I like watching on the sidelines. Is to uh, I, I rarely get emotional about investments, but it was uh, it was um, astonishing to watch. Uh, that's for that's for certain. Um, John, this has been so much fun. I could ask you about uh, stocks and business ideas uh, all day long, and we may have to have you back on uh, to, to keep the conversation going. Where do people go? They want to check out what y'all are up to, read your uh, insights, follow along with the crew. What's the best place? Uh, Bridgeway.com. It's a good place to go. Beauty. Thanks so much for joining us today. Great. Thanks, Matt. Really, really had to enjoy talking with you.